Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Safran and this is Kitco News. If you haven't already, don't forget to click that subscribe button now for the latest in commodities and market news. Well, today on the show, higher for longer, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell recently hinted that the Fed is taking a careful look of inflation trends and the revised data before making any moves on interest rates. Now, we're about to dive into what this means for the economy, the impact on gold, and the ever-evolving cryptocurrency market. Our next guest says that a rise in the one-month PMI above the three-month average strongly indicates a potential economic turnaround. Now, remember, the Purchasing Managers Index is like a report card for businesses showing if they're spending less or if they're spending more on products and services. So let's find out what that means for our investment. Frank Holmes, CEO and Chief Investment Officer at U.S. Global Investors and Executive Chairman of High Blockchain Technologies, joining us now. Frank, thanks for coming on today. It's great to be with you. I appreciate your time. Uh, we were talking a little bit about this PMI, and I want you to break it down for the audience a little bit on your micro take. Explain to our audience your analysis that a rise in the one-month PMI above the three-month average suggests an 80% chance of an economic turnaround. Break this down for us. Well, I've gone back over 20 years, and at U.S. Global Investors, we have sort of a a macro thesis, and we say that we believe that government policies are a precursor of change. So we focus on leading indicators. And ISM is, is the also called PMI globally, but in the US. But really, it is, it's an indication that you're going to make copper motors. So that means you've got to go and put an order in to buy a lot of copper because you've got a big order to, to produce all these copper motors for delivery in the fall. And you're going to use energy to do that. So what's happened as a great leading indicator of commodity demand is that when one month goes above three months, then the price of oil starts to go up along with some of the base metals. And and it is each month, the one month stays above the three months, it starts to grow the probability of all the base metals rocking and rolling. 18 months ago, the US a PMI number was just under 60 the globe was above 50, everything was rocking and rolling. And then it sank. Germany went down to pre, almost pre-COVID numbers, uh, which fortune is last summer, Germany bottomed and has been turning up. China is turned up. So when we add up all these countries, the G20, we see that the last month is above the three months. And this has occurred now for four months. Uh, it's a positive factor. And when it's above what's called 50, that means the global economy is expanding. And think about this. We're in election year. 70% of the world's population of 8 billion people are going to the election polls. This is a big year. Now, we, lots of publicity because America is the biggest GDP, but we're only 4% of the world's population. We may be 25% GDP. So what we really want to look at is the rest of the leaders of the world are doing everything to pump their economy. And what's positive about this year is that rates are going to fall. They look this way in the next quarter that we're going to see rates tra tracking down and we see PMIs rising very, very bullish for base metals and extra is for gold and silver. Okay. Now, you've mentioned that gold could easily hit new highs with the pent-up demand. Obviously, we've seen central banks around the world starting to bolster their reserves. Consumer demand also up, too. I mean, they're selling it at Costco, for goodness sakes. So how high are we going for gold? Well, I, I believe if I look up some of the money-based aggregates, gold should be over $7,000. Um, and, and I think that gold, I predicted before, I think it goes to $4,000. Uh, to reset relative to all the money printing that's happened in the world. But what's interesting is that is in contrary to what's been happening for the past 24 years, this century, and that has been the immersion and, and the growth, the emergence of, of MMT, modern monetary theory. The idea that we can stimulate uh, economic activity, get full employment, and then we can easily tax away that money uh, to balance so the inflation doesn't get, get too crazy. But since that's been practiced and discussed by the G20 countries for the past 24 years, and it's been adopted not 100% by every nation, what have we seen? We've seen gold outperform the S&P by 50% over the past 24 years. I think that's pretty significant. When modern monetary theory believes print as much money as necessary, 
and then we'll try to find a way to tax it away. Well, each time we have a crisis and they have to print money, it, it grows exponentially. It's not a linear equation. And, and so we're seeing in this election here, let's get the MMT going and let's get rates down and let re-elect me and get that economy going. And that's what we're sort of seeing that makes it a bullish scenario, whereas most of the media is very negative on, on the stock market. It's overvalued. Uh, but now we're getting Einhorn come out yesterday and say value approach to picking stocks is out the window. Uh, it's more on, on EBITDA and cash flow. Uh, so we're seeing some structural changes, which I think are all part of the great digital transformation. Let's talk a little bit more about this MMT. Break it down a little bit. Like, why aren't people paying attention to this? Well, I think that very savvy and smart people are. And I think that the brains behind the creation of Bitcoin understood it because what's similar between gold bugs and, and Bitcoin uh, uh, advocates is they both read from the Old Testament of Adam Smith economic model and theory. They, they do see that money, excessive money printing relative to the economy will create this inflation. And, and you want to make sure that you have decentralized assets like gold. Uh, and, and what I've found in my journey is that they both talk about the GDP to capita, GDP to debt, uh, consumer debt relative to the GDP, whereas the MMT, the, the 20 finance ministers for the G20 countries and central bankers, uh, they really dismiss that as being a good indicator of the economy. But I would say that that debt level, when they want to go borrow money, it's really important. So if it's really important for me to go get a loan or a mortgage, what my income is to my debt level or my debt servicing, why wouldn't it be for an economy? So that just makes it that we are living under uh, I, this normal way of debt to equity ratios, so should governments, but they don't believe so. So they'll continue with this MMT and the experimentation. And that's what makes it very important to have alternative assets that are decentralized, like gold and silver. And now with the millennials and generation uh, Z that's basically ignited the world in education uh, is Bitcoin. Yeah. Before we get into the crypto world, because obviously you're a leader there, uh, are retail investors paying attention to at this, you know, at these levels? Like the metals market has been kind of overlooked, it seems, with equity prices still low in the whole gold at an all time new high environment. Well, there's been something that's been going on for probably about 40 years, and it's great, gained momentum. So the anti-mining, anti-carbon, anti-oil and gas policies that come out of the World Economic Forum, go to the UN, policies, it just takes time. It's sort of incremental. It's not like a, an earthquake that happens overnight. And, and, and this is a gradual process. You can see that governments like the big push in Canada uh, on pension funds are investing more money in China than they are in their own mining and resource sector. So there has been a, a, a geopolitical policy that's been anti-mining. And, and so we see that. And what that will trigger is an imbalance between supply and demand. And I, and I see that as, as, as we go and push for this renewable energy, the need for copper uh, if you really believe in that and the need for silver, and we're going to have more solar panels, then silver and copper have to go through the stratospheres because they're not bringing on big new mining operations. Uh, and, and I think that we, what the market, the world is looking for is where all of a sudden they wake up to this huge spike in prices. We do see this on supply demand short term when what happens in, in uh, Yemen uh, going after a few ships, and all of a sudden the price of shipping cargo goes up exponentially, and shipping rates have to go around the world. That supply shock does have an impact. But I think we're going to go into the next 12 years where we're going to see a lot of these metals all of a sudden go through this regeneration until it changes the thought process towards copper and gold mining. So is this cyclical event, is this mining, this junior mining and commodities uh, boom, as we call it, is this going to go on for that long, 12 years? So I, I think it's, you know, we're going to have to get gold above probably something like $2,500 uh, and hold above there. 
And when it goes through 3,000, then I think it will ignite the mid-cap, small-cap gold stocks. Um, there are other sort of structural things. Uh, the push in Canada to have pension funds that are managing your Canadian pension, et cetera, that they should be investing back in the country. That would be a policy decision that, that countries like Australia have done. Uh, because if you ask a fund manager, uh, myself, my fiduciary is to get the highest rate of return. Uh, if you create a border around that, and that says I have to invest 30% of those monies from Canadians back in their economy, then I think that that would see a different price action in the junior mining and resource sector as a whole. Um, uh, otherwise, we're going to get these pockets where I think that uh, the companies that have the most reserves per share that are small cap get bought out by the mid cap, and the mid caps get bought out by the big cap. We saw last year Newmont buy make a major acquisition in Australia to basically maintain uh, their presence as a big company. It's going to be a Pac-Man of these other junior mining companies until gold gets through that, say, $3,000 level. Right. Yeah, big consolidation taking place. I must remind viewers, too, that we just had an interesting interview with my colleague Michelle McCory and Pierre Lassonde and also uh, Frank Jutra on talking about this. So I tell everybody to go and check that out, too. Let's switch over a little bit and let's talk about the crypto world. Frank, you have a ton of experience in mining and gold, especially kind of, you know, your fame is that you kind of created the royalty model too, but you're also a leader in the crypto world. Recently, your management team at Hive and you had the chance to meet NVIDIA's CEO, Jensen Hang, a trillion dollar company. Tell me about the meeting. Yeah. Well, it was, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience. It reminded me of going to Warren Buffett's AGM where Warren Buffett's in a basketball arena or a hockey arena with 15,000 people. Every ticket is sold out and they usher you through to the convention hall and all the companies that he owns as, and his conglomerate are there in booths and they'll sell you ice cream or insurance uh, and jewelry. So I think that experience was very similar. They had about 11,000 people for NVIDIA week and, uh, and, and that attended and then they had an incredible convention hall in San Jose where a lot of the users of the chips, Hive is a platinum client of NVIDIA because we bought a lot of chips with the, with the vision years ago to go into high performance computing for AI. But this is before JotGPT took off and, and it's before Ethereum disappeared as a, as a cryptocurrency. But we saw this as a long-term vision. So we we're a big buyer of NVIDIA chips that allowed you to do both, that, that allowed you to do this incredible uh, data processing information. And uh, and so that's the reason why when there was a special party, there was a hundred of us that got to get served wine by Jensen. And he was such a wonderful host, a uh, glass of one hand and bottle of the other, going around and serving and, and telling about his vision for the company. Uh, and so that's Hive as part of that. Interesting. Let's uh, elaborate a little bit more on Hive. Obviously, a Bitcoin miner. Uh, you guys are not new to the table. It's a very well-known company. The stock's done extremely well. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what you do and why you use NVIDIA to power the chips. Well, you know, Hive was, was an interesting journey because I was trying to launch an ETF. I had several ETFs on the New York Stock Exchange, and, and uh, the Bitcoin ETF intrigued me in 2017. Hearing the CEO of Fidelity saying that at a crypto event where people are spending thousands of dollars a ticket. That never happened at a gold event, gold stock event. And it's so just something big's happened that Abigail Johnson's speaking and she's been mining in Quebec and she believes that blockchain is, is the future for settlement of all stock transactions. So I said something big is happening, but I realized that you weren't going to be able to do it. And I was pretty you know, accurate because the only this past quarter this year did finally an ETF and Bitcoin get launched in America. So I would have been twiddling my thumbs for seven years. Uh, and, and that idea of launching a hive, and I was the chair and I put up the first five million and immediately 30 million came behind it. Fidelity gave us a hundred million dollars, other institutions, and it became a darling as the first crypto mining company. I did that because when you mine, you actually create what they call the virgin a coin, the Genesis coin. And that coin is untouched in the, in, in the ecosystem. It's not traded. So 
you don't have any AML or KYC concerns. So I said, this would be a good way for US Global to participate. And that's been an incredible, volatile journey. I tell everyone before they ever look at buying Hive, just understand the DNA of volatility is 10 times the price of gold uh, on a daily basis and a weekly basis. But in that journey, I discover that the people that follow Bitcoin that really love it actually read from the same test, Old Testament of gold and why gold is an important, decentralized, not controlled by any one government asset class. And I also recognize that, that it's an alternative asset class. So it gets put in a bucket with gold does and the same with private equity uh, in that category as alternative assets to bonds and stocks and ETFs and mutual funds. So in that journey, I realized that there's a big demographic factor. It was in that, that the swim of my baby boomer vintage of passing over this wealth of trillions of dollars going to millennials and generation uh, X, Y, and Z, uh, that they grew up with smartphones. You know, I, I, I remember when there was no mobile phone. I remember the first fax machine. So this is all ubiquitous for them. And, and, and the idea of them winning awards on digital awards if they were good gamers. Well, guess what's happened? All these new companies are using gaming tools to ignite, motivate uh, buying a product or service. Robinhood has a gaming. As soon as you go to open an account on Robinhood, it's a bit of a game. You earn one share in a new company. So this, this, this whole group of, of young people are going to inherit this wealth, and it was so easy for them to embrace Bitcoin. It was just easy. They were used to digital money. The only thing digital that I was used to was my mileage points. And that's the best example of showing devaluation because 20 years ago, it would cost you 20,000 points to upgrade the business class from Vancouver to Toronto. And, and now it's going to be 100,000 points. And if you want to go to Europe, it's 200,000 points. So they devalue that digital value of those mileage points, which I can share with you and vice versa. So it was quasi-digital money. Uh, and what's happened is that Bitcoin has evolved and I and I, it's been built by we the people for the people, not by any corporation or government. It is has 18,000 nodes all around the world that are validating and supporting this ecosystem. It's quite remarkable. It's quite resilient. So I think that these parts are leading into the next spoke in the digital world, along with AI and Hive's position in converting data centers and it's with its data centers that we're having downtown Stockholm and downtown Montreal is basically for this industry that people want to, coders want to come in and use our services because they're a lot less expensive than going to AWS. So they can turn around and, and do their coding and create new games or, or, or new apps, et cetera. So we're very excited about participating and we've seen it grow from a quarter million, a, qu uh, a quarter to a quarter million dollars uh, a month. And hopefully here in the next couple of weeks, a quarter million dollars a week. Um, and so we are positioning, we're looking in Vancouver, to have a place in downtown Vancouver, downtown Toronto, uh, where we create our sort of Starbucks of these data centers and co-location places where we have our expertise with these NVIDIA GPU chips and we'll be buying more GPU chips, the new 100s, uh, and, and as we build out our business plan. Yeah, talk to me a little bit about these new chips and the energy efficient advancements in the technology. I mean, how does Hive plan to balance its growth in crypto mining with the environmental concerns? Well, you know, it's a great question on environmental concerns because a lot of Bitcoin, uh, how much energy it consumed has been called FUD. It's been false, it's created uncertainty and doubt regarding how much energy. And it's been well documented now that it consumes such a small amount of energy than what was originally alleged. Now the data centers and the use, but it's one of the things that's really simple. No data centers, no internet. No data centers, no smartphones, no Netflix. And, and, and there's a, what we have found in countries like Sweden, an educational process with government workers and, and bureaucrats and politicians, they think it functions over here all along. That just data centers are something separate as a business 
not realizing that it, it drives our conversation right now. Streaming these data centers. So I, I see that the, the growth in the data centers is going to continue. And what is very epic is what Amazon just did. And Amazon just bought a nuclear reactor, spent $600 million for 900 megawatts of sustainable performing electricity because of the data center business. So that automatically made nuclear energy not bad, but actually good. That That is a pivot move. So I, I think that when we look at Bitcoin mining, it consumes much more electricity than um, than NVIDIA chips consume for uh, for these GPU chips for providing you for AI services. It's a lot less for the same amount of revenue. Uh, but the CapEx spend, the amount of money that you have to put into a data center is 10 times greater. So you have a bigger front end load cost in a data center that's going to be for high performance computing than you do for crypto mining. But then you will use a lot less electricity if for high performance computing than you will for Bitcoin mining. So I think what's going to happen is that the Bitcoin mining is going to have to do things like we're doing in Montreal, where our building of, of 40,000 square feet heats a building 200,000 square feet. So that same molecule, hydroelectricity, that mines has an, has an additional benefit of heating a building. And we're looking at that for northern Sweden for hockey arena, of uh, uh, the engineering for that. So I think we're going to see uh, if you need it for drying rice for farmers, that all of a sudden you could be Bitcoin mining and you could have another additional use, reusing the heat that comes from that system. I think that that's where the technology is going to go. Um, but how to, you know, data centers are on a boom. If you look at the multiples of, of the data center ETFs, for example, they trade at 10 times revenue per share. They trade at 20 times EBITDA. Hive doesn't come close to that. So I think the whole a strategy for Hive is a reposition that we are in the data center business and we have Bitcoin mining over here and we have HPC for a high performance computing over here. Interesting. Uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit. I mean, the SMR is a fascinating story using nuclear energy to power some of this stuff. But I do want to get into Bitcoin having because obviously it's an event that's approaching very quickly. And Hive has a substantial holding in Bitcoin. I think about 2200 you mentioned. So how are you preparing for potential market shifts? And what does this mean for Hive's profitability? Well, it's huge. I mean, just think a year ago, 20,000 to 70,000 uh, at the end of March is, is corrected off from that level as we go into the halving, which is normal. This is what's done in the previous three halvings. Um, I, I, I think, and we've lived through the halving. You know, we're being the first crypto miner, we've experienced the loss of, of Ethereum as a proof of work to proof of stake. And we've been through a halving. So we've prepared for this. And the two big things was have more efficient um, chips that are mining, so are much more energy efficient. Uh, to up to basically the, your consumption of electricity to get that exa ash to get that Bitcoin, it has to be a much more efficient machine. Uh, we do that every week. We're adding higher quality machines. So the Bitcoin, as long as it's over for us, uh, over fifty thousand uh, dollars, we're okay with this having as it takes place. Um, uh, or anything over sixty thousand is profitable. It's uh, we have the lowest cost of GNA to mine a Bitcoin. So that's something that we're really proud of ourselves. Looking ahead, in your opinion, what new technologies are you most excited about, about crypto and the AI world? Where are we going to be in 10 years? I mean, it's it's crazy out there. It's fascinating. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and, and when you talk to and see the amount of money, I've been back and forth in the past six months to Silicon Valley, probably every month now. Um, at, at different events, and you just shocks you at the sheer number of dollars that are going into uh, the AI business. Uh, it, and it reminded me four years ago the amount of money was going into uh, uh, Web three, uh, blockchain, uh, the, the innovations that were taking place there. It's now going to see. I think there'll be a fusion over the next couple of years with blockchain and AI. Uh, and, and AI to there's just so many applications. Now we do get the boogeyman and the concerns that could take place, and, and there's always going to be nefarious characters. 
but with healthcare, uh, with I think it's probably very significant for compliance. Uh, that that it's become so expensive the compliance for all the investment community, that, and the same thing happens for many of the banks that you could basically have only a few people and up later uh, upload everything into an AI system that can answer and review questions like you now have these bots when you go to rent a car uh, that can talk to you and find a solution and go through your compliance manual. Um, they they can monitor these things. So I think that th- it'll be an important part of every industry. It will only add value for those that embrace it as a tool, as a saw, as a screw, as a hammer. You have to embrace it as a tool. Yeah. And don't be running away. I mean, as you just said, there's a lot of investors coming to this market with education now. They're prepared for this. Uh, Absolutely. Learning a new language, it's faster, it's easier. Um, uh, So Grabify, I was told yesterday how many people that has exploded. Uh, and, and and how it re- corrects all your letters uh, in any letter, especially for in America. The, the funny part is that some of the Chinese employees we had, uh, they were working for us back 20 years ago. I remember vividly, their grammar was better. There was better than 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 the UT Texas system. Uh, and, and and you're talking about graduate degrees. Why was that? What is the grammar? So we look at it that this AI phenomena is going to be able to help educate so many people on English grammar and what is the best. And those that grew up in the system can now raise the bar dramatically to get better jobs if they can improve their grammar. Uh, And that's what AI software is going to do. You heard it here. Frank Holmes, CEO and Chief Investment Officer at U.S. Global Investors and the Executive Chairman of Hive Digital Technologies joining us today. Thanks again for your time today, Frank. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. I I appreciate it. And I'm Jeremy Saffron for Kitco News. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, tell your friends, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.